In today's video, I will talk about MRI after ACL reconstruction and more specifically about signal intensity of the graft itself in a normal case. So this is the first video of a series about this topic of MRI after ACL reconstruction. So make sure you hit the subscribe button and also this notification bell so you get an update every time I upload a new video. Hi, my name is Dr. Christoph Acton and I'm a musculoskeletal radiologist. In my YouTube channel, I teach you everything you need to know about musculoskeletal radiology. So let's talk about MRI after ACL reconstruction. And first, a little introduction. Maybe you know this already, but anyways, I think it's important to put in here again. Now, one thing you need to realize is that there are different graphs that are being used. And so you can use gracilis or semitendinosus tendon from the hamstrings, then you can use bone patellar tendon bone graft or quadriceps tendon graft. These are kind of like the most commonly used ones. Sometimes they also use allografts and all of them have like different properties and behavior on MRI, especially with regards to maturation. And so what can happen is after ACL reconstruction that there is a graft rupture and failure in up to 12% according to that study here. So it's not something we uncommonly see. So it's quite a common thing to have MRI after ACL uh, reconstruction. And why do they do MRI after uh, ACL reconstruction? So one thing can be to assess the position of the graft, of the tunnels. You can assess for complications. You certainly want to assess after a re-injury whether the graft is still intact or not. Um, the graft healing and maturation, it's not really a clinical question. It's more something that we as radiologists have to deal with when we get a patient with symptoms after ACL reconstruction. And this is actually today's topic. So we will just focus on graft signal intensity today on MRI after ACL or after primary ACL reconstruction rather. Now, the graft signal changes with time. This is kind of like the first thing that you need to know. And the general healing process of the newly inserted graft can last over two years. So it's quite a long time until we believe that the graft is now quite stable and okay and not much is happening on a cellular level anymore. And there are four key steps to this. So initially when they put the graft in there will be a vascular necrosis because you take some living tissue out of its original place, you put it in somewhere else, there are no vessels connecting this with the rest of the body. So there will be certainly a, a vascular necrosis. Then, and we will go through this in more detail, then you will have a revascularization phase and then also a cellular proliferation phase and finally the remodeling back to uh, something that's similar to the initial ligament itself. So let's have a look at the vascular necrosis first. As I mentioned, you take living tissue out of somewhere, you put it in somewhere else, so it's gonna die pretty simple and once it, it looks like it dies or there is a vascular necrosis then there are cytokines that are produced and they diffuse out of the dead material and this then on the other hand induces growth factors to come back in and these growth factors then allow the graft to mature and heal and ultimately they also lead to ingrowth of blood vessels and this is the so-called revascularization phase. Then after the graft is revascularized, there is a phase of cellular proliferation where you have actually more cells within the graft than uh, what you would normally have. So it's, oh, uh, let's see if that animation didn't work fine. So it might appear a little bit thicker. This is not really something we see on MRI. This is just to illustrate that there will be more cells in it. And with more cells within the graft, it affects also the signal of the graft, which will be higher in intensity, which we come back to later. And then after this final remodeling phase or during this final remodeling phase, which is the fourth phase, it's going back to normal. And it resembles, based on the signal intensity alone, pretty much a normal ACL or has a similar signal intensity like the PCL when it's not uh, injured. So the signal on MRI is depending on time, as we said. Now, in, in an animal model, the highest signal was observed between 6 to 12 weeks and high signal was also associated with low strength. And it took about 6 to 40, 24 months to have the same signal intensity as the native ACL in this kind of like animal model. 
But this is basically the message. Hyperintense signal of the graft correlates with the hypervascular and hypercellular reparative tissue phase that I showed you and is considered to be normal certainly within the first year. However, high signal certainly in the distal two thirds can also result from graft impingement. So we keep that in mind. Now for bone patellar tendon bone grafts, and you can see how that works here. So you take a little bit of bone from the inferior patellar pole, then the midsection of the patellar ligament, and then a little bit of bone here at the tuberositas here. And this is basically your graft. And you put the bones into the tunnels and then you have your ACL graft. Now, if you take this out and put it in to a body, it's going to be low signal like the original patellar tendon, certainly in the first few days or weeks. Uh, I put in here the first month because it's still the same tissue. It did not have time to really die because they are low vascular structures anyways, and it takes some time until this stuff dies. But then between 16 or around 16 to 18 months, we got this increase in signal intensity. And with in one of the studies, they showed that it takes up to 18 months after the signal is very similar to the original ACL. But this is now just to give you some numbers here for bone patellar ten bone, but I will provide you a, a nice summary at the end of this video. Now with hamstrings allograft, it's a little bit different because so they take out these two tendons, one or two tendons, and then they have to fold it four times. They can even make something like a like a like a plat or something like that here, where they kind of like well, cross it over all the time. So with these hamstrings autografts, there is a issue, and that is that you can have high signal between these separate strands of the tendons here already from day one, more or less, because you've got fluid in the joint that can find its way in between these fibers. But this fluid is aligned parallel to these strings or the tendons and this is considered to be normal. Now if you see this kind of linear fluid signal changes in a bone patellar tendon bone graft that would be abnormal. So it's important to know which graft actually or which graft technique that was used. With quadriceps tendon grafts um, we can have intermediate signal for four to eight months and then it starts also decreasing over time going back to normal by about 12 months. With allografts, so tissue from a, from a, like a dead body that you put in there, you have similar behavior like the others. So you have initially the normal signal, then it decreases and then it starts, uh, increases and then it starts to go back to normal again. But it takes typically longer, up to two years until the signal is pretty much the same again. And it not only takes longer, but because it takes longer, there's a higher risk of failure if you start to do sports and stuff like that. Now, I found interesting in one of the articles that they mentioned viral transmissions during that. So hopefully you don't get coronavirus from a allograft for ACL repair. That would be really stupid. But uh, I didn't look for this, so it's probably more about HIV and stuff like that. So the normal ACL graft, now this is kind of like uh, what you should take home is directly postoperatively low signal because it didn't have time to really get necrotic yet. Then with a peak at around six months, so between four to eight months, the signal is pretty high and it's considered to be normal. And this is time after surgery. Then it slowly is it's going back to normal and should be normal in about or after about 12 months. And then what I already mentioned, hamstring graft can show tiny amounts of fluid linearly parallel to the folded graft, that's fine. In a bone patellar tendon bone graft that would be abnormal and everything takes longer in allografts. So this is kind of like the summary. But this implies a few different things. So if you have a MRI of a ACL reconstructed knee, you need to know when the surgery was in order to really make a conclusion with regarding to the normal signal intensity of the graft. And you should know which technique that was used. So high signal in the first postoperative month, as I said, is abnormal because it should be still normal. So it could be after a, a re-injury very early on. Then it increases in the first year, so peak around six months. And this process is called ligamentization and it's a normal process. And after 12 months, it should look like the original ACL. This is kind of like the rule of thumb here. Now, this comes the big caveat. Some say it takes two years until the signal is back to normal. Some say 
there can be tiny spots of high signal even after four years. And some say that it's never going back to normal uh, again. So there is a large variability. And there was actually a very nice systematic review on this graph maturation. And they included 34 studies. I have the paper or the link to the paper in the description down below. And they mentioned that the studies were very heterogeneous, like different techniques, different sequences were used. And this makes it really difficult to compare these different results. And that's why we have these different numbers, right? So on PD and T1 after gadolinium sequences, high signal peaks around six months. And on gradient echo sequences, signal increased for 12 months, remained low, or even did not change at all over time. So that's really really crazy because depending on which sequence the signal can do whatever it wants it seems. And only seven of these studies correlated MRI with actual clinical outcomes. So T2 signal, and that's the conclusion they came up with, the T2 signal did not predict clinical or functional outcomes after ACL reconstruction and that was early on and also long term. So far I haven't shown you any MR images and you can now quite understand due to this systematic review why that is. So it's very heterogeneous. There are no really good studies about this. Techniques are very different. And the conclusion was that we would actually need something like a biomarker, some, some objective you know, parameter like a T2 star or there are other uh, like fingerprinting stuff, kind of like that thing. Maybe artificial intelligence will help us with that. But what I take away from this uh, systematic review is basically we can't really make good decisions based on the signal itself, although there is a lot of, of, te of teaching about this. And if you read the review articles, if you read the original articles, it's always very short, this, you know, these passages about the signal of the normal graph. They, they all say it's going to increase and then it's going to decrease again. And this is very like confusing for a lot of people when they read actual MRIs. And so I would say as a rule of thumb, uh, do the following thing. You need to know when the surgery was, you need to know which technique was used. You can have a look at the signal if it's high or if it's higher in the first year, but still obviously you have a continuation still there, then it's considered to be normal. If you see high signal after 12 months, then I would start to get a little bit more worried. But since there is not really a good clinical correlation, um, I'm not sure how much emphasis we should actually put on this. So that's, uh, that's my takeaway from this. Now, I hope you liked this video. Uh, if so, hit the like button. And if you want to know more about what I do, you can check different links in the description down below. You can become a member of my YouTube channel, which is something uh, very exciting and it's new and it allows me to increase you know, the output and also the quality of my videos. You'll find a join button somewhere down below. And you can join for a few dollars a month and you get uh, different icons, perks, and uh, depending on which tier you go, you get even exclusive videos and access to my MSK school where there is kind of like a private Facebook group, but without the Facebook stuff, where you can chat and discuss stuff, uh, videos, and so on and so on. So it's a new project that I'm developing right now and I'm looking forward to seeing you there. And with that, thanks for watching and see you next time. So before you move on to the next video, I want you to briefly reflect on how much benefit you get out of my videos here. How much of the stuff that I'm teaching you can you actually apply in clinical routine? If you get something out of it, then you could consider to become a patron of my YouTube channel. Patreon is an online platform where people can support other content creators just like me. You can find the link over here and click there right now. Now, there are other options as well. If you really want to go to your next level in MSK, then you can consider to join the Virtual MSK Radiology Fellowship. you find the link down here and also in the description of this video. The Virtual MSK Fellowship is a one-on-one -on -one case-based teaching program where I help radiologists to get to their next level by increasing their speed and especially confidence in MSK reporting. So go check that one out.